So Kate and I have a guest for the main uh, discussion today. We, we have do. Jessica Rose joining us all the way from Birmingham. Which the, you'll find is, is the finest city in the UK as well. Yes, we'll Ooh. just clarify it's Birmingham in the UK despite the American accent. Which yeah, might it's confuse nice people. Is it something like Birmingham? I can't Birmingham. Tell it. Birmingham. There we go. But anyway, yeah. that, that, we've just offended at least one person there, so that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't get me uh, my into... My apologies to everybody in Manchester who have to be in the second best city in the UK. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, anyway, so... Jess, tell us a little bit um, about who you are. Oh, that's a nice, big, scary, open uh, question. So, um, hmm. I'm, yeah, self-taught technologist, and I, I work on a lot of projects that uh, sort of work with facilitating access to either technical education or work in technology. Um, yeah, I'm an American in Brum and massive Brumophile, just the, the biggest fan of the city. What, what, and I don't mean, I, do, I mean this in the pe- best possible way. <laughs> what is there to love about Birmingham? Oh, you're going to regret that. You can edit out this because it, it'll go on for about 20 minutes. Sorry, just checking. Do you say Brumophile? Brum. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, so yeah. Brum. So Brum's sort of a, a local name for Birmingham. So the folks from here tend to be called Brummies. Uh, I've heard Brummajum as well, which is wonderfully old fashioned. Um, yeah, I'll try and bully you two out for a visit sometime soon. It's just an oh, absolute it's, 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 it's not hard because I think the one thing that would sell it to Kate was probably joint first best curries in the UK. <laughs> Quite clearly. <laughs> it's got more miles of canals than Venice. Uh, the city market, so the open markets have been on the same site for 2,000 years. Really great Chinese food, really great Indian food. For me, it's like the most laid-back multicultural city I've ever been to as well. Okay, it's making wild So you faces. see places like New York or <laughs> Sydney or Kuala Lumpur, I get a lot of credit for it, but Birmingham is just <laughs> so laid-back and so easy. Okay. Tell us um, where your journey in technology began. Oh, dear. I, um, I was a teacher and a linguist for a long time, so uh, taught in the States and then out in Japan for a bit uh, and followed my now husband sort of back to England. Um, and I, I, it's a little bit embarrassing, but wound up working for this like divey little startup, like kind of dodgy, but not terrible, like good kids. Uh, and I noticed that all of the programmers got paid on time (laughs) and they didn't, I, I, I was fairly sure that they were getting paid a bit more than me as well. Uh, but at, at the time getting paid on time sounded really attractive and it didn't look that difficult. Uh, which might have been a, a, a failure to understand the complexity in the system. Uh, but yeah, started still teaching and sort of moving up to more and more technical roles. And now I work in developer relations, which is a weird combination of public speaking and writing. It's it's sort of community building and outreach as well as technology. Actually, this oh, is sorry. something I wouldn't mind um, going into a little bit more because it's not something that gets spoken about too much um i know of one if we're talking podcasts i know of one podcast that covers this topic very loosely uh, and they still cover it more from a marketing perspective anyway so yeah what would what would you describe as the 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 point the goal the aim of developer relations so i'm I'm actually i'm so i'm going through the process with some potential employers now and i'm always really careful to spell out what developer relations does and doesn't do Uh, When I first heard of this, I thought that there's no way that this is a job. It was just too good. Um, But developer relations is generally, and it it is a type of marketing. It's a way to market to some of the most difficult in a good way, sort of the the savviest potential customers possible, and doing it in a really technical way. So you can uh, you can get a couple different outcomes through developer relations. You can get people sort of aware of the product, hearing about you. You can grow your user base, especially for sort of open source or free software projects. It's really, really valuable there. Uh, and you can do a lot of community building. So you can say, do you know what? We want to have developers talking to each other, talking about what they're building, showing each other tips and tricks. It's a really good way to sort of build 
have people responsible for building community spaces, which I quite like. Do you feel that um, to do that kind of role, you have to have um, adequate or even appropriate technical knowledge? Or I don't know, it's always been somewhere, some something where there are some people who do and some people who don't, but it kind of depends who you're evangelizing or relating to. Um, and some of the audiences you have to deal with can be more stuffy towards people who <laughs> don't know what they're talking about versus those who do. Do you think it matters or do you think it's more about being pleasant to people and that can be enough? Um, so this is actually something I've, I've ranted about on the DevRel podcast. So we're going we're gonna to come around to that. Um, I, I sincerely believe that you have to understand the product, understand the use. So you have to understand what, what you're asking people to do with something. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that the split, so community managers and developer relations professionals often essentially do the same jobs. Um, so you'll see the exact same kinds of activities in the, in both roles. You'll see people writing technical content, managing technical communities, public speaking at hackathons. Um, and it's really frustrating because community manager is generally presented as a less technical role. And it's it's not paid to the same level, which is very frustrating. A community manager is generally paid role, so unpaid. Oh, okay. I've seen some some community manager roles that that I was very unhappy with the salaries attached to. Yeah, it's interesting. I've um in the, in the week, I was away at um, Node.js conference in Amsterdam, and there was a, a sort of underlying feeling of political discontent, shall we say, with you know a certain cohort that was attending uh, that were fairly visible and fairly um, vocal about it. And it, it, I think there are a lot of challenges in how they were able to manage that discontent. And it's an open source community, so. Mm community management is often left up to the community which mm. <laughs> is, can get yeah, confusing i can probably talk a bit more about it yeah now, i'm always the last we'll to about i think it's probably a very valid discussion to talk about with jesse okay, <laughs> so, um, all right i'll just mention it briefly i mean i was attending in a press capacity um by that i mean i'm looking for opportunities to write about developments and the use of Node.js. Um, I was also attending because of my knowledge of IoT. So through that, I was I chaired a panel on IoT and Node.js, which was interesting because I had to be pretty clear to people saying, look, you know, I am very, very interested in this area, but I'm not a developer. I'm not an engineer. I don't have a coding background. Therefore, my knowledge is more about, um, the, you know, the challenges for startups the applications and so on. So, you know, it's a different perspective. And people, to their wonderful credit, were very gracious about that. And that, you know, that was very much appreciated. Um, you have to excuse my breathing a little bit as well because I'm recovering from cold. Um, but, yeah, like from the first session I attended, there were people getting up and saying, you know, we have a massive problem in this community um, and people aren't happy. And the problem is that people feel unwelcome and largely the people that feel unwelcome are women. It's a diversity problem. It's a problem with inclusion. And it's it's an interesting um, thing to see as an observer because I had spent some quite a bit of time when I was at um, a Linux summit or an open source summit, I should say to be exact, in Lake Tahoe in March where... I spent quite a lot of time talking to the Node.js people about their community and particularly how they managed community after the forking of the product and then, you know, the resurgence after that. And again, you know, being clear again, I'm talking more from a sociological perspective than a coding perspective. Um, and I do know that they had invested quite a lot of energy into diversity um, and making you know, concerted efforts to make people feel, feel welcome from having committees to um, mentoring to having different opportunities that people could get involved at a beginner level um, to be, you know, sort of supported to be included and to work their way up the, I don't know, the food chain, if you like. And 
I, my, my understanding was that some of those practices had been disbanded or had been changed and that um, people, particularly people that were identifying as genderqueer or queer or um, not uh, heterosexual, were feeling that they particularly were made to feel or were getting negative responses from people. Um, and apparently a lot of it had happened over two weeks and a lot of this was alluded to but wasn't very clearly presented. And it was, I think for me, it was very interesting seeing this board out at a conference because my main problem with that was not that it's the wrong forum for it, not at all. I think it's good to bring issues up. Um, but that the conference was structured understandably due to time constraints, like most conferences, in a way that a lot of the sessions didn't have space for discussion or questions. So you were kind of either left with people whispering in corners or um, one, you know, sort of cryptic uh, tweets or other things. And so it was, was a little bit hard to get, you know, a feeling that, that this was the space to actually resolve this in a concrete way. Yeah, I, I think that's always really challenging. So I'm, al I'm always really cautious to sort of uh, look as abstractly as possible mm. at communities where I don't have sort of a strong membership when I see oh, things. Absolutely. Um, but I also think it's really interesting because there's almost no dedicated space. So I hear again and again um, from folks in communities and, and for folks, especially for folks who um, the complaints about inclusion or the complaints around, um, around community cohesion and welcomeness. For folks who don't feel that that's an issue, I often see them sort of pushing back and saying, well, this isn't the time to talk about it in an event. This is mm. not the space to talk about it online. This is not. And looking at people who feel unwelcome in communities, that has to feel so dismissive to say, well, mm. we see that this is a pressing thing for you, but this is not a priority for us. There's not a space here. There's not a space here. And it often seems like sort of relegating people's complaints further and further back until they're being discussed someplace where nobody has to listen or nobody has to participate. Mm. Um, yeah, it's really frustrating. I think that, uh, not specifically Node, but just communities in general, that once you sort of get a bad reputation um, or once people start to feel unwelcome, changing the tone of an existing uh, community is so much more difficult than than building for the first time. Um, and I think that if things get, get to the point where a community has to say, oh no, now we're very welcoming, I think a lot of the people who've left or felt excluded before are gonna be fairly suspicious about coming back around. Mm, absolutely. Mm. I have the, could we think of any, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think, I have good examples of ones that are good and ones that are bad and um, even sub communities, like for example, you know, PHP generally is not that welcoming, but some of the sub communities of PHP are. <laughs> well, it's funny because, like, at the conference, I got a very positive perspective by some of the side projects. Like, there is obviously a Node school, and there's mm. one called um, Node Together, which unfortunately they don't have in Berlin, but it is. There is a Node school here, I think. Yeah, but there's not Node Together. That's what I just said. Um, which is basically a, a teaching program for women where the, I guess the aim of it is to create apps. So the reason it attracts to me as a concept is it has an outcome. So it's, I've been to a number of coding classes as a, you know, quite a beginner and it's very hard because you go for a day and you leave and you sort of don't have a, a space for the knowledge to put it to incorporate it into your life whereas something where you make something and it's something concrete is, is a very way good way to engage beginners as an example um, and I might add as a conference most of the speakers if not the majority were women as well or non-defining gender so I think they actually got a lot of things right as well yeah like when I look at communities who are just doing things really, really well, so I don't think anybody, any community at scale is going to have problems. And that's not an excuse. That's not, oh, well, we've got more than three people. Of course, there are problems. Um, but so within PHP, I absolutely love Laravel to bits right now. Laravel, I think, really started with building 
community and the technology at the same time, which was really valuable. Um, and I never miss an opportunity to say nice things about Python. How lovely are the Pythonistas? So I guess we can say that with a lot of these, with open source communities especially, um, usually the, the the core foundation, the core project, it's it's probably focused on furthering the project. Mm. Um, and there has to be space left for the community to self-organize, to, to do the things where gaps are. Uh, and the ones that do it best are the ones that leave the, the most open gaps in terms of um, allowing people to actually fill those gaps and not being too uh, sacred about not letting them fill those gaps. Um, and I guess open source as a, as a general would mean it would it would imply that um, that anyone can, but it's not always the case, I suppose. Uh, and the ones that manage it better are the ones that leave more open space. I think as well that you get communities that really take quite a bit of direction from what's visible within the community already. So if you've got, I think Matt, uh, Ruby and Matt's is a great example. The whole Ruby, we are nice because Matt's is nice, um, has become sort of a community touchstone. People keep coming back to it like, well, let's try and be nice. Uh, and within Python, you've got really vis uh, visible Pythonistas who are very, very uh, interested and very, very, um, they, they really invest a lot of time in building community spaces, building educational experiences and keeping things just really lovely. Uh, and I think that if you've got communities where um, folks being unpleasant or unkind or jerks mm. are, are being brought together and sort of given visible spaces, it, you're getting at people who are okay with that and think that's the tone that, of the community they want to be in. And you'll see that continue to develop in that direction. And if you have folks who are very visible and sort of rewarded within the community with status and influence who are really, really aimed at keeping things lovely and snugly and warm and inclusive, uh, you'll see a lot of people who care about those values trending and heading over there. So actually, it's uh, possibly counter to what I just suggested in that, in fact, to keep, and I don't think this is unusual, and I think we've probably all experienced this, to keep communities running, you do actually need um, a, con a considered effort um, a considered um, way you're going to do things and to have people on board with it. And maybe, you know, I'm not saying that uh, deciding to have a nice community is a bad thing, but of course it it means that that's, you're either on with that or you're not, I suppose. Mm. <laughs> so it's not, it's not terribly open in that perspective, but I think you, you'll probably find the minority of people who don't want it like that, but they are there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I think it gets really challenging because at some level you have to start asking yourself as a community member. And, and the thing is, technical communities, it's not like you just get up one day and say, no, you know what, I'm going to go do this other thing now. Mm. You've invested so much time and so much energy. You've learned to do these really cool things. You've made meaningful relationships with these people. Seeing people leaving a community... Uh, is somebody who's made a difficult choice with about something they care about. Mm. And I think the challenge is it can feel really hard to curate role models within a community. Yeah. And you say, well, we can't, we can't do anything about this person. They're a really valuable community member. They've been around for ages. And I think the difficulty there is that is a really concrete loss. If you say, well, we, we don't want to remove this person from, the board. We don't want to remove this mm. person from speaking engagements. We don't want to remove them yeah. from a position of status because that's a visible loss. Whereas the pe people who are quietly leaving communities or the newbies who come in and go, that is not for me, isn't a really visible loss. You can't really measure that unless you're listening very carefully. Yeah, yeah it's like, um, I guess, the legacy members or um, founding members of organisations. I actually saw a... Um, uh, a meme recently I quite liked about that and it was basically about the notion that you should be polite or 
not, um, you know, to give you know, consideration to older people for their rudeness or their bigotry. It's like, oh, you know, they're old. And the response was very much one of, well, that just means they've been through all kinds of, you know, historical events and experiences in civilization, and they still haven't learned from it. <laughs> Ooh. It's, quite, it's <laughs> quite clever. I quite liked it, and I agreed a lot with the sentiment. I think there's uh, different levels of all sorts of people, including older people. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I wouldn't limit it to just yeah. one. Maybe we won't go down that path too much. I wouldn't mind actually... Um, Asking you, Jess, uh, I know this was something I have seen you talk about in the past and I'm not sure if it's something you don't talk about anymore or I just haven't seen you talk about it recently, but the um, the concept of imposter syndrome in this sector. Um, oh, dear, I'm speaking about that. Um, so wow, I, okay. Wednesday, Wednesday. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and there's, there's some reasons coming that I'm coming back a little bit full circle with some of your recent activities um, on this in a second. But Just to clarify, is, it, is that in an event, Jess, that you want to um, let our readers? Uh, of course, I'm going to be speaking at uh, DrupalCon in Dublin, which just looks uh, yeah. so exciting. That is a community uh, so that I was... Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, and the organisers have been, if I can give them a shout out, so great, like so a great speaker experience awesome. it, it's actually well just very very quickly at a tangent that's an in, because i was inv- heavily involved in that community in the past and one of the things I, I don't want to say one of the reasons i left it wasn't one of the reasons i left but one of the things that was being discussed quite a lot when i left was this actual very topic of how to recognize people's contributions who when it's not so obvious and i think it's something a lot of communities technical communities go through and it was one that they were going through and i'm not sure if it's been solved yet or not but um you know official recognition it's it's kind of it's very easy to um and we saw uh, with github changing their metrics around this of course um that yeah. just the amount of code you've committed is not doesn't mean that it's any more or less valuable than something else that can't be so easily tracked um, oh. Yeah, <laughs> that would ruffle some feathers, I'd imagine. Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. It, it doesn't ruffle as many as you think. I think the bigger issue is just how to actually represent it. Okay. Um, it's like if yeah. I go and do five talks, what does that actually mean? I could go and do five talks to five people, or mm-hmm. I could do one talk to five hundred people. So does the fact that I've done five talks is it any better than doing one talk? It's, it's, yeah. it's about how you measure it. Yeah. Technical stuff and code stuff and is very easy to measure whereas other things aren't, and that's kind of the problem. I and mean, it comes back to the whole discussion of developer relations, the, the <laughs> worth of developer relations. It's how do you measure it? And um, something I remember from when I was doing actual Drupal stuff was that I would talk at an event, and sometimes six months later, a client, a potential client would come forward. You know, how do you measure that? Mm. It is an immediate effect. Um, yeah, and this is this is why the community struggle with it. It's not that they don't want to do it; it's just figuring out its worth is is very hard. Um, but yeah, um, let's come back to the imposter syndrome. Maybe if uh, you could explain briefly <laughs> what, what what that means, what it means to you, what it means. Uh, so yeah, I, I describe imposter syndrome as this uh, sort of cold, sick, wet feeling that you get in your chest sometimes where you feel like you have no idea what you're doing and everybody around you, they seem fine. They seem like they know what they're doing. So clearly you don't deserve to be where you are. You don't deserve to be doing what you're doing. And oh God, everybody's going to find out you're a fraud. They're going to catch you. You'll get fired. You'll, you'll lose your flat. Um, not sure everybody goes through those same stages. Um, but yeah, it's the, it's the feeling that you're not as competent as you actually are. It's it's your brain having a terrible time with self assessment. How? I mean, how? Okay, this this is especially an interesting, pertinent point for people who are beginners, and um, maybe Kate and I, in some respects, represent this in different ways because in some fields you are newer to understanding them. How, when, when, how, how can you tell that you do know what you're talking about, but um, you're not very confident about it versus actually maybe you've more, got more to learn yet? 
How does one, how do you tell them apart? Uh, awesome. So this is great. So uh, in my talks, I often talk about how the the feeling that you don't know enough is often your best sign that you're actually competent. Uh, so Dunning-Kruger is another cognitive bias. And it's, it's, um, um, it's a really, really interesting study. I love the study. But demonstrates that people who are the least competent are usually unable to see their own lack of competency. <laughs> it's great because the ab- abstract actually says too stupid to know they're stupid, oh, wow. uh, which is delicious. That's biting. Um, yeah, it's good. It's good. Researchers. <laughs> but it's it's really wonderful. So I, I often frame imposter syndrome as your brain giving you really unhelpful error messages. Um, and I think that one of the most valuable things you can do in response to that is when you do have that feeling, oh, God, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, taking a very short break is so useful just so that doesn't spiral into weird panic. Uh, but also taking a, taking some time and doing self-assessment. So if your brain is terrible about assessing your skill level, go out and get validation externally. So I really love whenever I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, I always try and do some mentoring calls because giving somebody else support and advice, you come away from it thinking, oh, maybe I do know what I'm doing. Uh, Taking tests, building a side project, anything that gives you a sort of finished feel uh, is a really great way to combat your your brain giving you crappy error messages. And what if the outcome of taking one of those tests is maybe you prove you don't know what you're talking about? What's the what's or you don't know as much as you thought you knew? What's what's kind of the steps from there? I guess. Yeah. So having been a teacher and having been like a very fluffy uh, exploratory teacher, I was like, hey, we'll all learn together. I think that oftentimes we contextualize assessment and we contextualize failure wrong. Uh, so when you, when you do go through an assessment process, you say, ah, I have failed at this. I don't know how to do this. The message I'd really love people to be taking is, oh, I need some more support with X. I need to do more Y. Uh, so this, the emotional feedback of a failed assessment is weirdly devastating when really it's nothing's changed. You've just got more information that lets you know what you need to work on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a very nice positive way of looking at it. Oh, yeah. It is. Actually, yeah. Very constructive. That yeah. actually gives people something to work with. Yeah. That's a very nice positive way of looking at it. Actually. Absolutely. And, and I oh, think. Yeah. yeah. And I'm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying all of this like, oh, do you know what? It, you need to separate the, the assessment from the way you feel about it. But every time I fail something, I, I am appropriately devastated and feel like a failure and have to come back around. No, for sure. Uh, and it's, it's not even that, though. It's those sometimes the, the, it's the, it's the personal stuff. It's the saying something that's perceived by everybody else in a room as, huh, you know, that wasn't the smartest thing to say, and feeling really embarrassed by it. And it's actually, that's, that's often the worst feeling of it is, yeah. <laughs> oh, I do that all the time. <laughs> I'm yeah. kind of used to that feeling. <laughs> yeah, and and I mean, yeah, it, it's it's. It, I think and coming back to community, different communities, and I include just I don't know a room full of people as a community in this context. Uh, uh, co- different communities could be better at making you feel worse or better mm. about situations like that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, And I think in technology, we're often spending a lot of our energy trying to show how clever we are Mm, Uh, and often in ways that sort of tear at other people. So every time you hear somebody say, well, this isn't a question, it's more of a comment at the end of a talk. Um, Whew. Uh, Just for the listeners, speakers hate that so much. Everybody, (laughs) everybody hates it apart from the person who who put it. (laughs) I I haven't... There's another term for it, which is called a lefty question, um, which is because it's so popular in left-wing political circles that people, when they say you can ask one question, they get up and they'll do the um, either three questions in one, or which takes about half an hour to ask, or alternatively the comment that's not actually got a question. Hmm. I, I, yeah, get the, I get the impression they come from the same the same source. 
smart people trying to outsmart each other, mm. <laughs> as you just said. <laughs> um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I think we cut it, you, we cut you off somewhere. So sorry. sorry. No, no. Um, and yeah, for me, it's just so exhausting and so self-defeating. So we've got a lot of people trying really hard to show each other that we're very clever. Um, and that doesn't really allow for a lot of space for collaboration and working together. Yeah. It, it's, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. And again, I think coming a little bit more circle, this actually relates nicely to the sorts of work that we all do. Um, explaining technical concepts in a, a variety of different angles. Um, actually, we may not be as clever as some of the people who we help explain, but we're better at certain aspects of it. Um, you know, I spend a lot of my time trying to explain what very clever coders have done in, a, in, a, in words that will make sense to people. And sometimes they're very clever at coding, but not very good at explaining things. And Kate, you do it in the way of um, getting it out to a, to a kind of more mass market of understanding why something that someone very clever has worked on might be useful. Mm. And Jess, you do it in a sort of cultivating those people kind of way, you know. And maybe we're not as clever as them in that particular way, but we're clever in other ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, especially in the work line of work I'm at, um, stopping, like it, it's, it's a, it's a personal failing. There is nothing I dislike more than people talking to me like I'm stupid and working in technology is a great way to find a bunch of people who are super happy to talk to you like you're stupid. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm not, I don't think it's malicious. I think it's just the, a lot of the way we communicate in tech. Um, and I think that giving up on that really made like it made me much better at outreach and also made me a much happier person yeah so now if somebody does want to go ahead and do it i'm just like oh, okay that's nice i'm just gonna write your name down on a list and remember to never hang out with you <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> i think oh, God, i think I've actually have a an actual list yet I have a mental list. <laughs> I'm kind of liking the idea of the list. Actually. <laughs> it's not published, but it's a mental list. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'm going to sort of slowly steer the conversation towards an end via a couple of uh, alleyways. Um, so one thing that Kate and I like to talk about, and I'm, so I'm going to start with you, Jess, is uh, things we've been um, up to the past whatever period it was since the last time we did a podcast. And I know specifically starting with you because you already alluded to it, but you have been spending some time um, the past couple of weeks doing uh, mentorings and sort of one-to-one -one sessions with people yeah. who want them. So I would love, you know, in as much as you can actually um, say, um, the sorts of things you've been talking to people about and, um, I don't know, the commonalities you've spotted around what people are needing help with um, yeah, as much as you can talk yeah. about it. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in between roles right now, which has been really exciting, and I'm caught up on sleep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's, it's glorious. Uh, but because I had a little bit of extra time and I hate to relax, I've been doing a lot of mentorship calls. And I really recommend these for folks who want to get better at leadership skills or just want to do something nice. So it doesn't have to be something formal. I just go ahead and ping out on social media. Hi, I'm available for one-on-one -on -one mentorship calls. Um, and it's really interesting. So I've been having quick 30-minute calls with folks who want to talk about uh, either getting into public speaking, which I'm always super happy to talk about, uh, folks who just want someone to listen and help them navigate what their career path might be, uh, and then folks who have like really specific questions about things that I'm not always qualified to help with. But that I'm, I'm really interested in sort of chatting to them and seeing what kinds of resources we can find. Um, and the thing that's been common amongst all these calls, so all of the career calls, have been things where it's just me listening to people talk, tell me about what they're doing and what they want. Mm -hmm. And really just repeating it back to them in ways that sound really actionable. I think deep down, everybody has a really clear idea of what they want to do. But sort of getting validation externally for that, getting someone to say, like, no, that's a great idea, do it, uh, is something that we don't often have in our professional networks. 
this is actually, you just sparked a thought in my head. Uh, someone told me, and I, can't, I was to try to find the details, but um, someone told me about a guy in the US somewhere, and it sounded like the perfect job, as far as I was concerned, who people pay him to, and I think now he's got other people helping him, to just uh, walk with and talk at. <laughs> so, so um, and you know, yeah. I mean, this, this is not an original idea. Mm. Paying people to listen to you is, of course, not an original idea. Yeah, I think it started in San Francisco. Probably. I think like it probably did. I am. But no. um, it, it's just that, that kind of, yeah, do not underestimate the uh, power of just, or the, the need maybe of just having the opportunity just to talk with or even just at someone for a while is actually, um, yeah, and we were talking to some coaches during the week as mm. well at a startup event here. And I've always been a little sceptical about coaches, but then some of the stuff they explained actually made me see it in a completely different light. Um, and one of the people was actually a very high up executive with quite a well-known project, which I won't name. Um, and he, to me, and this comes back to the imposter syndrome thing, maybe, mm. or reverse imposter syndrome. I don't know who had the imposter syndrome, him or me. This guy to me was good looking, he was he looked healthy, he had a high powered job, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Internationally travels. International travels, stuff, yeah. yeah. And then he said to me quite openly mm. and bluntly that he uh, speaks to a, a, a guidance counsellor, a psychologist, um, a careers counsellor. Careers counsellor. But he was actually saying this person was more of a psychologist. And we were talking about this very, very bluntly and he was quite happy to talk about it. Um, and again, yeah, it's that kind of thing. I think sometimes speaking to people like that makes your own imposter syndrome a little less. Mm. It is, yeah. I think it was a bit of an yeah, like, for you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've given this imposter syndrome talk a bunch of times. It's one of my favorite talks. It's, it's probably something I need to retire saying. But all through the talk, it's just 30, 40 minutes of me saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. Everything is terrible. Everything is terrible. Uh, and every time I've given this talk, I've had somebody come up to me afterwards and say, oh, wow, you've really got things to your life together. Uh, but what should I do? I'm just like, I, I do not have my life together. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, I think as long as you're not visibly freaking out, everybody assumes everything's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Can, actually, on that note, on the note of that specific talk with what you just said, Actually, I wanted to ask you, maybe I should have brought this up earlier, but now you've mentioned it, it seems like an opportunity to, to talk about it. Um, so I've only ever really seen you do that talk, the, the imposter syndrome talk. And um, so do you, and in that talk, you do play the, um, the play the, I think of a nice way of putting this. Play no. the, play the, play, play. I just could, any word I could think of is, is play the idiot, which is not the right word. But you, you mean you, self-deprecating? Yeah, you play up. Yes, you play up the self-deprecation. Is that something you only do in that talk for effect, or is that something you do all the time? Oh no! I, I, I best case scenario, I'm an affable goofball. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I just wondered, uh, out of interest, I wondered what if a maybe you question, were, Chris. no, because because you just brought it up. I just wondered if it's like, do you what? do it intentionally in that talk, or is it a common thing? <laughs> um, I think that it, it it's not very modest, but there are a bunch of things that I'm I'm just straight up great at, uh, and I'm I'm not very shy about that. Uh, so recently I've been doing a bunch of job interviews. It's been really nice to say, okay, well, here are the things I'm fantastic at. Um, but I'm, I try and be really open about the things that I'm not especially strong at. Um, and yeah, I think that at least for me, being more open about my self doubts, being more open about the fact that I, I, yeah, at the end of the day, don't have any better idea of what I'm doing with my life than anybody else does, uh, has been weirdly freeing. I think because I get so, well, because I've historically gotten so, can I swear? Yeah, we do. We're oh, not Americans. Cool. Well, well, yeah, well, you are, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> uh, because historically I've gotten them a bit fucked off when people speak to me like I don't know what I'm doing or yeah. that I'm dumb or that I don't belong in a space. Uh, just owning some of that, it's been really yeah. nice to say, yeah. hey, yeah. here's what I do. Here's what I'm great at. Here's stuff I'm not great at. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. way, if folks come along later to be like, well, you suck at this, they'll be like, yes, I do. How can I yeah. help you? Yeah, yeah. Can, uh, 
Can I just, my favourite example of this, and it's a really stupid example, and when I've said it to people in the past, they've like, why did you say that, Chris? But you know, have, you ever, have you ever seen that scene in 8 Mile with Eminem? I've never seen that movie. There's a great, like, rap battle at the end, one of the final scenes, where, you know, he does the same thing. It's really, it's actually, it's really worth yeah. seeing. Maybe it's on YouTube, where he kind of, you know, you know rap battling is all about sort of actually ripping it out of each other. And so he basically just opens up with, yeah, I'm this, and yeah, I'm that, yeah, I'm that, yeah, I'm that, yeah, I'm this. Now what are you going to say? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's <the same>. mm. <laughs> Weird example, but... <laughs> I think I'd have to see it. Yeah. But I think it's actually quite a powerful scene, personally. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> it, it is something I worry about, though. So I know that um, I'm really, really interested in sort of the way we think and the way we attach um, information to subconscious bias. Uh, and I do sometimes worry that me saying like, hey, I don't always know what I'm talking about um, is is likely going to it could potentially undermine the standing of sort of women in a technical space. Well, well, um, yeah. OK. This because I think I think actually all three of us probably employ this um mm. this 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 tactic this this trope this um yeah i think we all probably employ this same uh, thing about when we speak yeah i think we're all fans of self-deprecation yeah i know i do it because i often when i'm talking to people it makes them feel more comfortable um for interviews for example therefore they're more willing to share um their experiences or information that they might not otherwise feel inclined to share but do you do you feel it could ever bring a negative to to you or to something you may represent to people? Uh, or? Probably. I mean, I think that they may think of me as a bit, um, sometimes a little bit dumb or a bit ignorant in interviews because I don't always have the deep, intricate knowledge of their product because, you know, the way it works in writing journalism is that you know a lot about... Um, lots of you know a little bit about lots of things so therefore you don't always have a deep deep understanding of the intricacies of someone's you know someone's back-end product or what have you or their manufacturing experience so um, I guess where I try and really pull rein that in where they might be going oh that person didn't really ask a good question or you know is I try and do a good a good article so I try and do a good, honest, but intelligent and thorough um, article. Hmm. And, and yeah, that, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. for me, I, I do worry about it. But I, I, yeah, I think that people who would be likely to abstract the gaps in my own skill set or abstract uh, the gaps in my knowledge and experience and apply them to sort of women across the industry. Um, yeah, I think folks who do that might just be assholes. So I don't know how much energy I have for that. Yeah. That's pretty common. <laughs> and then I think you've both already said, you know, but you follow it up with the end result of what you were, you know, what you're related to being good. So it's, it's kind of like, well, if you're going to judge me based on a half hour talk I did and not look at my body of work, mm. then, well, yeah, yeah. It's a good point. I, <laughs> you can totally judge me on that talk. It's a great talk. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You know, you know, anyway, okay. Um, I think it's probably time we start drawing to a quick close. So um, let's go round the table. <laughs> um, Jess, so in addition to like the, the mentoring calls, what else have you been up to the past week? And what have you got? coming up over the next few weeks you'd like to tell people about um yeah so i did an article for gadget that i'm quite pleased with myself oh, with um uh, there was a sun article uh for international uh listeners the sun is kind of a newspaper <laughs> in the uk <laughs> yeah uh, which i don't generally have beef with but they wrote kind of a silly thing about open source uh so yeah i got some really really nice experts to help me rebut it uh, so unusually pleased with myself. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and we'll be sure to put a link to that article on um, on our website with the podcast. Yeah, I'll have to find it because it's hard, it. it's hard to Google because, of course, you get lots of results about sun, as in sun microsystems. Yeah. So I'll have to oh, uh, yeah. dig, 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 dig a little to find that. Oh. 
And in the next couple uh, of weeks, you, you've got a talk coming up at DrupalCon Dublin and anything I else? Do. Uh, so I've got a bunch of talks coming up. I've got a talk coming up in Dublin. I'm really excited to be out speaking at Dreamforce this year. So out to San Francisco, and that's going to be nice and stressful and weird and exciting. Um, but yeah, just lots of speaking and lots of being on the road and lots of mentorship. Fantastic. And just to clarify, Dreamforce is a developer event for Salesforce, in case you haven't mixed. Oh, thank in those. You. <laughs> and again, we okay. will put all these links yeah. on the bottom of our. Um, Actually, podcast. that's another topic I would have liked to have got to the community in closed source. But anyway, uh, let's. Uh, maybe we've got time for that. Maybe we have time. Kate, what are you up to? What, what anything you want to highlight from the past few weeks, and what are you up to over the next couple? I'll of weeks? I'll try and keep it brief. Um, yeah, look, I've been working on lots of writing. Um, it's been a little bit slow getting it published at the moment, just because our editor's been travelling a lot. A um, couple of highlights, I guess, that I've been working on. One is um, been looking particularly at um, smart cities and stepping back a little bit from the kind of bigger picture of smart city to look a bit more about the whys um, because I think it's an area that's not really been explored. And and a case example, which we've probably all seen in the media, is in New York, the link system uh, public kiosks. Mm. There was a bit of an issue there where they found that... The kiosks are basically free Wi-Fi, free charging stations, free city information and free phone calls for people, members of the public. And the claim was that, well, firstly, oh, homeless people are using them, which suggests that they're an outlier and they're not actually active members of the community in public when, you know, the public is this space is essentially their home. And secondly, that a small number were watching porn or masturbating while engaging with them so they've just uh what's the word um they've had to cancel the wi-fi functionality i think but i mean i think there's a couple of really interesting issues one is about how we use public space who's allowed to use public space and the policing of that action secondly one about um the fact that there was a limited way to actually really be able to respond to this um, I know this particular issue, if you're going to be blunt and look at it, of pornography in public, uh, the viewing of pornography in public from the internet is also a, pub- a, a problem, particularly in um, public libraries. So, you know, the unintended consequences of smart cities not being planned. Uh, and then about, you know, some of the bigger issues of po- the policing of public cities and public space. So I, it's think, I think that's a topic we could cover in itself. Yeah. Um, just another quick one I've been working on at the moment is um, about safe... Uh, which one should I mention? Just edit that big, Chris. Okay. <laughs> another one, quick one I've been looking at is the British Standards Institute and their guidelines into social robotics. Um, they produced a document, the BS8611, Robotics and Robotic Devices, and it's basically a set of guidelines to um, help designers and people interested in in robotics create ethically sound robots. And I guess the really underlying principles there are don't use robots to harm or kill people or animals. And there's a certain level of irony just in that because we know, for example, that um, there's a lot of scenarios where drones are used to kill people um, and... Is a drone a robot? A lot of, a lot of questions there. Did the military get uh, special treatment? <laughs> yeah, or the police for that matter. Yeah. The police do use drones a lot in um, shooting situations. Uh, but yeah, I've so hence, you know, a little bit of research into humanoid robots and some of the uh, sociological consequences there. And um, it's, of course, another area that you could talk about for months because it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, I'd encourage people to have a little look, see very interesting area i feel slightly uh, dumb now mentioning mine after you've talked about the uh, ethics of robots and smart cities but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i started a new job in the past couple of weeks with uh, a company here in berlin called contentful which has taken up quite a bit of my time but has been pretty good so far so on the side of that um for code chip i wrote an article on an introduction to core os which is a sort of production operating system for containers, if you're into those sorts of things. Um, I started redoing my uh, weekly squeak of series of links each week. So I've had a couple of those the past few weeks if you want to check out some interesting links. Um, 
spent quite a lot of time working. This is going off on a slight tangent, but I've mentioned my board game on this podcast a few times, and I'm taking it to Essen, the biggest game fair in the world here in Germany in about three weeks. So I spent a lot of time putting out some updates to that, which I would love it if you tried them. Um, And finally, over the next couple of weeks, so I'm going to Voxt in Belgrade next week to talk about Swift, Mm -hmm. which is not something I'm talking about much more these days. It's a bit of a hangover talk. Uh, And then I am speaking about uh, documentation at LinuxCon here back in Berlin. And if you are in Berlin, we're having the Write the Docs meetup here tomorrow on Monday. Uh, And I hastily assembled a panel for it, which is actually quite interesting. It worked out really nicely. Kate's going to be on it. Um, Our friend (laughs) Charlie Sorrell is going to be on it. And someone else... (laughs) <laughs> whose name I've completely forgotten because I only met him two weeks ago, is also going to be on it. And all three of these people are tech journalists. Um, and they're going to talk to our writer community about how tech journalists kind of represent um, tech, I suppose, in a different way. And that's uh, here in Berlin tomorrow. And you can check out the Meetup page to find that. So, um, yeah. Jess, uh, I have your Twitter handle as... Maybe you can tell people where they can stay in touch with you. Uh, yeah, if you want to see uh, stuff I'm writing, uh, jessica.tech is my very vain vanity domain. And you can find me on Twitter at uh, Jess Lynn Rose. Great. And thank you very much for your time. Um, and yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Y'all have been oh, delightful. That's... Absolute no pleasure. I think we've had a really interesting discussion this morning. And we will see you in the next episode of the increasingly inaccurately titled Weekly Squeak. Yes.